Hi, welcome to the factory. Today we're gonna go over 104 Espresso. This is a prep video for that. In a minute we're gonna go down to the lab and we're going to walk through our equipment that we use. Uh, we're gonna walk through and define our terms that we use when we're dialing in Espresso. Learn how to pull a shot, learn how to take care of our, our equipment. We're gonna back flush. Just a reminder, feel free to pause, uh, take your notes and get ready for that quiz at the end. Be ready to come in and just crush it through class. All right, let's go. Let's start with the basics. Um, first, let's talk about the espresso bar and the different parts that we have and that we're working with. So this is a three group espresso bar. What I mean by that is that there are three group heads. One, two, three. And when there, there are three port filters. So this is the port filter. Inside of there is a basket, which you can remove and you'll be removing. Um, when you do back flush the bar, we'll talk about that later. So the basket, there's a spring, and then the port filter. Inside of our group head is a screen and a screw. See the screen and the screw. I'm gonna use a stubby screwdriver to remove them. And it's hot, so sometimes I'll use a towel. those two pieces. Inside of our group head also is a gasket. It's a basically like a thick black rubber band that keeps the seal between the porta filter and the group head. So in the future, if you're ever pulling a shot and water seems to be leaking from between the group head and the porta filter, it might be a gasket issue. So if you ever see espresso or water leaking from between the group head and the porta filter, for the time being, you might need to just push the portafilter in a little bit more to stop it. But eventually and immediately, actually, you should place an MR so that somebody can come replace those gaskets or see if there's something else that could be wrong. Also on our bar, we have brew switches. Not every bar is gonna look the same, but for the most part, we have a swirl button that is going to set the timer when we start and stop our shots. That's what we'll use. And we also have a switch we could use that does not start or stop the time. There are often other buttons on your bar that might look like little shot glasses with espresso in them. Um, those would be pre-programmed if we were to use them for that purpose, but these ones, I believe, will function the same way as your swirl button. Some bars, however, have, are programmed to only dose out about a second worth of water, and then they'll just stop. So I recommend always using this roll button, just in case. And then we have our shot glass. When we pull shots, we'll be pulling them directly into our shot glass. There should be a scale set on your bar, something smaller, that will be able to fit underneath the porta filter and the shot glass to catch the shots. There's another scale. Over here in front of my grinder, this one is an Akaya scale, and I use that to weigh my in dose when I pull my shots of espresso. And then I have towels. We have towels with certain purposes, as you learned in 103. The purpose of the towel underneath my bar is to be used for wiping down my counter, as well as my drip tray, and keeping my space clean. <coughs> We discussed the milk towel previously, but there's also a customer towel. Your cafe may have something like this that you store between your refrigerator and a counter just to wipe off customer cups. It's meant to be kept really clean because you don't want to put something dirty on something somebody's about to put their mouth on. So we also have a porta filter towel, and we always use the back side of the towel to wipe out the inside of our porta filter so we can keep the dirty side on the other side. In this way, this side of our towel always looks clean um, because in many cases our customers can see everything we're doing. So it's very important to keep all of our things clean. This is a grinder most commonly used in all of our cafes for our regular espresso. So we're going to deal with a lot with him today. He is a K30, is how we most commonly reference or refer to him. Our hopper is on top, that's the name for that. There's a gate to close off the coffee 
from the rest of the machine. Open that gate whenever I'm using it. In order to adjust grind size, there's this knob that sets, um, sets our collar in place. So if I want to adjust the size of the grind, I would move this entire top right or left. That's a very extreme movement. You'll never use an extreme movement like that when adjusting grind size. So then to put it back in place, I'm going to make sure to tighten that knob down just until it doesn't move anymore. No need to overstress that screw. To adjust my dose, I'm going to hold down either of these buttons on the side. Right now I'm dealing with the double cup. You can see that my time is set to 3.5 seconds. And if I want to increase or decrease the amount of time that my grinder doses for, I'll hold down this button and carefully twist the knob next to it to increase or decrease the time. So I'm turning it left to decrease, right to increase, settling back at my time. You'll also see that there are some prongs or forks that you use to set your portafilter on when you're dosing. So when I do insert my portafilter, you can see that it counted down the time and fully dosed for 3.5 seconds. Um, and what I would do is weigh that dose in to see how much coffee I have. This button here is what initiated the dose. Um, if I were to insert the portafilter and pull it out mid-dose, you see my time has stopped at 1.9 seconds. This button is still flashing. That's how I know that I'm in the middle of a dose. And if I want to finish it, I can simply start again, just like that. If for some reason I dose and I stop part way, but I want to start all over with a brand new time, all I need to do is click my flashing button to reset the time to 3.6 seconds. So this brings us to the next tool we'll be using, which is the distribution tool. Before we settle or tamp or do anything, let's talk about this tool and how to take it apart. Uh, if I wanted to take this apart for cleaning, I would unscrew the top and remove it and unscrew the bottom carefully. It's very heavy, relatively speaking. And I would wash this separately and keep it separate to dry. If I were to put it back together wet, it will rust and I won't be able to take it apart ever again or clean it properly. Okay, so put it, to put it back together, screw this piece back in. And what I'm going to do now is determine the proper depth of this bottom piece. <laughs> okay. Okay. So ideally what will happen is that if this is at the proper depth, it's only going to level up my ground. It's not going to push the grounds down and almost tamp them for me. And it's also going to not leave any room for gaps on the edges. So let's see how we did. Yeah. Okay. Looks pretty level. I don't think I see any gaps. Still fluffy. Still a little bit fluffy. So that means that I didn't compress it too much and there's still room for my tail. An example of too shallow would be something like this. You can see that there's a bit of a crater on the edge because the tool didn't reach deep enough to move those grounds. Too fluffy. And it's also too fluffy, way too fluffy. Okay. Then an example of too deep of a setting. You 
can see how deep the puck is set in there now. And we can do the finger test. Not fluffy. Not at all fluffy. Okay. Great. Before we move on to actually pulling a shot, we, we're going to need to cover how to properly settle, distribute, and tamp the shot. So. Dosing in. Before I ever use a distribution tool, I'm going to want to level these grounds out as much as I can without actually touching them with my finger, but by using what you could consider karate chops or something of that kind to level the ground. So I like to hit from the side that's super low to cause the grounds to fall where it's low. And I can also angle my portafilter in that direction too if I need to level out my grounds. So they're pretty level. You could also do a vertical tap on the counter if you'd like in order to level them. Then we use our distribution tool. Okay. It's beautifully level. So to tamp properly, I'm going to stand perpendicular to the counter so that I can get this nice right angle. Okay, and when I push down, I'm just going to push down enough to compress the grounds. And that's all I need to do. Some people do a little twist or what, what's called a polish, but that can actually end up making your grounds uneven. It might cause you to push down a little bit in the front or a little bit in the back. And then you end up with this weird lopsided thing that shouldn't happen. All right, let's talk through pulling a shot. First things first, wipe out the inside of your port filter. Make sure it's dry and clean. I'm going to turn my scale on. If I do that while the port filter is sitting there, it's going to automatically tear out the weight of the scale. So I shouldn't have to tap tear to get that to work. Okay. Then I'm going to weigh my port filter again. And that would be my dose in. Now the problem with this weight is that it's outside of our recipe and our parameters. In your cafe there should be a green bike dial-in card as well as a decaf cream city dial-in card for your decaf grinder. <clears throat> this recipe as it exists says that my dose in should be between 19.2 and 19.5 grams. Whatever this card says is what you need to abide by. So if I wanted to make this 19.2 to 19.5, I could use a little demi spoon and gently remove some of my grounds until I'm within my range. Okay? So that's my dose end of 19.5. I'm going to settle, distribute. <laughs> Tamp. Beautiful, very even. And if I had coffee on my flanges, I'd wipe that off as well so I don't get inside of my brew pad. Before inserting to brew, I'm going to tear out my scale and turn it on so that my shot glass is not being counted as part of my weight. So now I can insert and brew. And my goal for my dose out is going to be somewhere between whatever's my dose out on my dial-in card. Right now it's 42 to 46 grams. I will need to stop my shot before the amount that I actually want out. So let's go for 46 grams, which means I'm gonna try to stop the shot around 42. Okay. And we're ending at 46. Nailed it. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> awesome. So I stopped my shot when I saw 42 grams, so that what came out was actually 46 grams. So it stopped right where I wanted it to, at 46 grams, but my time is at 36. And my dial-in card says that my shot time needs to be, to, to be between 26 and 33 seconds. So if I'm going to continue dialing in my shot, I need to get my shot to pull within the amount of time on my card. So the reason I'm trying to get within this range is because this recipe has been built around the coffee that we're using right now. 
So our team, our coffee team, works really hard to create a nice recipe that gives us a place to work from as baristas in cafe that's pretty much always gonna result in delicious espresso. So what they're telling me is that if I can get my coffee or my shots to pull in this range, they're probably gonna be delicious. So if we can start from somewhere there, in there, taste our shots, and then make adjustments, we're gonna end up with great shots every time. I still need to get my shots within range. Before I pull my next shot, I'll need to rinse out my shot glass. So I have a hot water spigot here, only used for rinsing. Here's a hot water spigot. Here's the button. I might need to hold this down or I might only need to press it once. Some bars are programmed differently, but that will get me to rinse out my shot glass. Be careful, that water is incredibly hot. Then I also need to take care of this puck that's still left in my group head. I'll remove it, rinse my group head. That must happen at least once between every shot. I only had to run it for about a second. Knock out my puck and start over again. So the problem with my last shot is that my time went too long. In order to adjust for that, I could do one of two things. I could either reduce my out weight, since I was sitting up at the top of the range between 42 and 46, I could reduce that amount that comes out and my shot time might decrease to be within range. Or I could coarsen up my grind. Coarsening up my grind would speed up the rate at which the water flows through the ground, which could also drop my time. And I could just keep that same out weight. So now I have a decision to make. If when in doubt, begin with the out weight. Begin with adjusting the variable of in or out before making any adjustments to grind. Grind is gonna take a long time and we're dialing in so we have some room to play. So let's start with that. And this time we're gonna taste our shots. Take note that when I move from one shot to the next while I'm dialing in, I'm only going to change one thing every time. I'm using the same in weight and the same, and but not the same out weight. Okay. So this time I'm gonna try for only 44 grams out. So I'll probably have to stop the shot when I see 38 grams on the scale. I'm not going to pay any attention to what's happen happening to this timer. I saw 38, I stopped it, it is at 43.9 grams and my time is at 34 seconds. And that didn't quite do the trick. I'm still gonna taste my shots. And the reason why is because I need an educated guess as to what really is the next best move. Anytime you're tasting shots, you'll wanna make sure that you don't taste what comes right out of the group head. It's important to either stir them like this, or you could decant them like I just did. But if you drink directly whatever came out, you're going to taste it in layers. And stirring them helps incorporate the different layers of flavor that come out while you brew. And will give you the best picture of what your shots actually taste like. Okay. So these shots are a little bit watery. They're a little bit thin. And they taste a little bit bitter. So what that tells me is that they're over extracted and now I know where to go on from there. In order to know how to dial in and to make adjustments based on taste um, within, of course, the range of our recipe, we need to understand the basics of what an over extracted, extracted and an under extracted shot are. So one thing to know first is that as a shot is pulling, as the espresso is coming out, we're actually going to be able to observe or taste a difference in flavor between what comes out first and what comes out in the end. So if I were to start a shot and stop it in 10 seconds, or we could say really early, like around um, 30 grams, I'm going to taste something very acidic, even salty. So those are the flavors we typically experience early on in the extraction process. 
The next flavor to extract or next perceived experience that extracts is sweetness. So I could start stop my shot closer to 40 grams out maybe and or 35 grams out and I'm going to experience something a little bit sweeter but it's still going to be way out balanced by all the acidity that I just extracted. So if I allow my shot to go way too long past our 46 grams out I'm going to certainly experience something very bitter because this is the way that flavors generally are perceived that come out during the brewing process. So first acid, then sweet, and then bitter. So now that we know that, if I pull a shot and it tastes incredibly acidic, it's more than likely under extracted and what that means is that I have not extracted as much as I want to get a balanced tasting shot. That's under extracted. If I pull a shot and it's heavily bitter, it means that I have likely over extracted my shot or pulled out more solubles than I wanted to. So previously I pulled out more solubles than I wanted to. I over extracted my shot. That's why I tasted bitter. So, I could do a few things. In this case, I'm gonna try stopping my shot even earlier. Um, so I can try doing that. Since it's certainly better, I will just adjust my dose out one more time to be at the very bottom of my range at the 42 gram out weight. So I'll have to stop it at about 36 grams so that my actual final out is 42. All right, so at 42, I'm still not within my seconds range. And what that actually tells me is that I'm probably not gonna be able to get to where I need to go unless I make a grind adjustment. So if I can't get my shots within recipe just by adjusting, adjusting my out weight or my in weight, it's time certainly to at least adjust my grind size. And if I want the water to flow through my shot faster so that I can get to that final out weight earlier, I'm gonna need to coarsen it up. To adjust grind size, I'm gonna want to loosen this knob and then move the indicator. And the way I think about it is this, if I wanna make my grind sizes or particles larger, I'm gonna move my indicator to a larger number. Anytime I do that, I wanna make small adjustments. So a quarter hash mark movement is gonna be all I need to make, like from four and three quarters to five. And I'll tighten down the knob so it doesn't move. And before I can actually use this to pull a shot, I'm gonna need to purge a few, um, a few sets of doses, a few doses out of that grinder. Two purges should be all you need. What this does is empty the chamber and empty the, empty the chute of any old grind size particles that we don't want anymore. So we should only be left with the size that we adjusted to. All right, so once again, I'm not going to adjust the dose in or the dose out. I'm only going to now use this new grind size to move forward. You might notice that your dose out becomes a little higher when you make a grind adjustment. So it's perfectly acceptable to make an adjustment to the time of your dose so that you're not always wasting coffee or scooping them out of your pour filter. So I'm going to stop my shot at around 42 to get 46 out. Perfect. And I'm within my time range, 29 seconds. Let's taste these shots. What I'm looking for is whatever the flavor descriptors are on this card. Currently they are cherry, apple, and milk chocolate. And what that means is that I'm going to have something of an experience that is that has like a cherry sweetness, an apple kind of acidity, as well as the sweetness of milk chocolate, and maybe the bitterness of a milk chocolate. All right, so I'm stirring my shot so I can taste them. And this shot has a nice little bit of acidity to it. It doesn't blow up in my face. It's not shocking. It's really nice and sweet, kind of like that of a milk chocolate. And it's not 
bitter. It's not heavily bitter, at least. There is something of a bitterness to it, um, but it's pleasant, and it doesn't sit in my mouth like uh, maybe like a dirty ashtray or a cigarette might. Those are all kind of disgusting, but in a way, bitterness should kind of remind you of that, and you should never have a shot that tastes like that. So the reason milk chocolate is our bitter tasting note is because even though some people enjoy bitterness in coffee, like heavy or dark roasts, we don't want that. We don't want a heavily bitter shot. We don't think it tastes that great in milk. Um, but in the same way, we don't want a highly acidic shot because that also doesn't taste great in milk. This is a wonderfully balanced shot between sweet, acid, bitter. So really, the way this espresso shot tastes to me is sweet, clean, and juicy. My mouth is watering. It's delicious. This is what we want in all of our coffees, no matter how we're brewing it. Sweet, clean, and juicy is key. My shots are clean. My porta filter's not dirty. Nothing is sitting in my mouth, leaving a bad taste. Um, it's certainly sweet. It's going to play really nicely with milk. And I'm salivating just drinking this espresso shot. So after you've dialed in in the morning, ideally this is what you do first thing in the morning or when you come in to take a bar from somebody else. You're gonna dial in, you're gonna make sure you're within recipe and your shots are delicious. At that point, once you've referenced just how long your shots are taking, what your dose in is, what your dose out is, your grinder is set close to where it needs to be in order to have consistent shots, and you know the volume of what's coming out, you can pull this scale and not worry about it during your shift until we come to some certain drinks. Anything that is espresso forward, like a shot of espresso, or a small beverage, like a cappuccino, or an Americano, for anything like this where espresso is highly dominant in the beverage, we're gonna weigh our outweight every time, making sure that our shots are just as delicious as they were when we dialed in. However, if I'm going through a long line of drinks and I've got five cups lined up behind me and I'm trying to get through a rush and I'm crushing it, I'm going to be able to not worry so much about the scale so long as I know what my final time should be as well as the volume on this shot glass. I need to pay attention to these two variables because if they start to change, I need to make an adjustment and I gotta do something fast because I can't serve bad shots to my customers. They have to be delicious. So, I can pull that scale only in the case that I'm busy and I'm confident in where my shots are pulling, how long, and what the volume out is. Okay. Let's say I'm in a rush and I get an espresso order. I'm certainly going to pull out my scale. I'm going to pull a shot using my scale, both the in weight and the out weight. I'm going to weigh it and I'm going to make sure that my time is the same. If for some reason I pull that shot and my time is different or my out weight is different, I need to dial back in. I need to taste my shots again and I need to make any adjustment necessary to make sure that those shots taste delicious. Because I'm not serving my customer who ordered an espresso, a disgusting, or a not good espresso. Anything we serve that is not of the quality expected, it's not within our recipe, is red, and that's unacceptable. Then, let's say I've gone through a really long drink, line of drinks, and I finally have a moment. I finally have a second to recollect myself. What I'm gonna do is clean up my bar. So I'll wipe down my counters. I will maybe rinse out my porta filter using the hot water spigot. Get any old coffee out of there. I can even do a little bit of a scrub in the inside of my brew pad. So I'll rinse out my porta filter, and then I can do a scrub in the inside of my brew pad. So get any of those old grounds out of there so that I can keep my brew pad nice and clean and make sure that my espresso also is tasting nice and clean. If it's been an especially crazy rush, I might even take out my screen and my screw and clean the inside with a towel, like I'll show you in a little bit. So, other than cleaning 
cleaning out our roof head and our porta filter, making sure that those are clean. We have to make sure that our counters are clean. We already wiped them down. We wiped down the drip tray. But I have this big old mess over here of browns. Maybe it's not as big as it could be. But what I can do to take care of those is even use this tray from my grinder as something of a dustpan. And scoop up all these rounds. Now ideally throughout my time on bar, I'll be trying to take care of these. All these rounds can't actually get on your porta filter, like on these prongs, and then they get in your coffee and cause problems. So let's make sure that we don't allow that to happen. And we dust up whenever we can. Another part of our cleaning regimen is the midday back flush and the end of day back flush. These things have to happen at certain times of day. So ideally a midday back flush should always happen at the end of your morning rush or in the middle of the day. Because usually the morning rush occurs between 7 a.m. and 11 a.m. So what I would do, or what you're required to do, Take out your porta filter, any and all that you have used throughout the morning, which should be all of them. If you have a three group bar or you have a two group bar, you are required to open all of them for the morning rush so that we can take care of our customers as quickly and urgently as possible. So I'll remove my basket and my spring, put them inside of this large pitcher with my porta filter. Using my palo brush, I'll measure out one scoop of kafiza and drop it in there. Then I'm going to fill this with hot water from the Fetco brewer up to the base of the handle. I don't want to get hot water up that high. I don't want to start allowing kafiza or hot water to wear away at that plastic or that rubber. Then I'm removing my screen and screw. And there are a few ways you could do this, but I want to get around this um, area between this hot plate, kind of closer to where that gasket is. And I can just use the brush, but one thing that's far better is wrapping a towel around the brush to get in there and also really get in all the little edges and nooks and crannies. You can see that every time I do this, I'm going to pull out a bunch of brown coffee. And I'm going to want to do this over and over until I get all of that out. Once I've done that, I'll make sure that my uh, screen is nice and wiped down. And I'll screw it back in before I begin the back flush. So at the end of the night, if we're doing an end of day back flush, we're going to take the Fisa, measure out a scoop of it, add it to the blind porta filter. Insert into the group head, run it for five seconds on, five seconds off, ten times. If I were to be doing this in the middle of the day, I can do this, but without the kafiza in the group. Two, three, four, five. So once I've done that for five seconds on, five seconds off, ten times, I'll dump out my kafiza water. I can even rinse my blind porta filter, rinse my group head to make sure there isn't any kafiza water left in there. Once my porta filter has been soaking for about 10 minutes, I'll pull it from the kafiza water. And I'm gonna use a either a green scrubby or no green scrubby, depending on my porta filter, to finish cleaning it out. So if my porta filter has a really nice, clean, um, silvery color on the inside and has not been damaged, I don't want to touch a green scrubby to it at all. This is the case in some of our newer cafes that have brand new porta filters. And if I were to touch it with the green scrubby, I'm going to ruin the finish on it and I'm going to forever require that porta filter to be cleaned out with a green scrubby, which is not at all what I want. So this porta filter that is not silver that requires the use of a green scrubby. You can see on the inside of it that there's some caked on black, which is just old coffee that really needs to be removed. Soaking it has allowed me to loosen up some of that coffee, some of those particles, 
in the end, to really clean it, I'll need to use even the smallest piece of fresh green scrubby to get that out. And when I'm done, I should be left with a really nice golden surface, like I do now, like I have right now, getting the edges and the bottom. And a little rinse with more Kefisa water will help really remove that. Last but not least, <clears throat> in here is where a lot of really bad buildup happens. I can use something like a thermometer and a towel or even a pipe cleaner to get in there really well and get a bunch of that out. Because a lot of black buildup will happen over time. I'll just double check it with the towel. So you can see this method too in case you don't have a pipe cleaner. If I find the really thick part of my towel, usually on the edge, Take my thermometer. I'll oftentimes pull out a bunch of really dark black rings. And once those dark black rings stop appearing, I'm done. Now that I've got the inside of my pore filter nice and clean, I'm gonna dump out the rest of my Kefisa water. I can pour it down my drip tray carefully because what's remaining in there is my basket and my spring. Use my towel to really wipe that down. Make sure that I've got all of the coffee off of there. Reinsert it into the porta filter. Wipe down my basket. Getting under these edges. I should be able to pop it right back in. I can rinse it with a hot water spigot if I feel I want to. And I'm done back flushing my group head, so I can put the porta filter right back in and I'm all set. So if it wasn't clear previously, when we do midday back flush versus end of day back flush, the only difference is the use of Kefisa. In the middle of the day, we don't need to use Kefisa, we can just do everything but with hot water. At the end of the day, we will use a scoop of Kefisa for our soap bucket, as well as the blind porta filter while we do the back flush. Once we're done shutting down our espresso bar for the night, we also need to close down our grinders. So in order to close down a grinder, I introduced you to this gate before. I'm gonna shut the gate and I'll need to dump all of these coffee, all the coffee, back into my bag. There will likely be a large bulk bag um, in your cafe labeled for green bites and decaf green bite, because you'll be doing this with both of your grinders. So now that my gate is closed, I can dump all my coffee back in my bag. I'm going to gently push down and twist in order to release the hopper. I'm going to empty all of the coffee in my bag by opening the gate back up. Please do this carefully. very easy to lose coffee when you do this. <clears throat> I'm going to turn off my grinder and if I'd like I can take a few of these coffee ground or some of the coffee that's on the top out, put it in my bag. And I don't want to get too close to the burrs that are in there because it can be very sharp. <clears throat> And then I'll purge the rest of my coffee out. So I'm going to turn my grinder back on. And I'm going to dose out the rest of my coffee. Put my grinder through it. I can look up here. I'm just going to get these off the edges. need to vacuum this out.
sure that dust doesn't build up inside of this fan so this fan works properly. <coughs> sink. Um, do not use anything abrasive in this plastic. It's going to scratch it. So Sorry. just hand wash it with soap and water. Rinse it and leave it to dry overnight. Leave it in your dish racks. Do not put it back on the grinder. We don't want any moisture getting in it. Part of the reason we do all the vacuuming and the grinding through is so that we don't have coffee and coffee oil sitting in there overnight. This is going to keep our grinders functioning better for longer. This hopper should never be scrubbed with anything abrasive, no green scrubbies, and it should never be put in a hot sanitizer, which would melt it. So if you have a three compartment sink, this should be fine as long as it's rinsed, washed, and even put in sanitizer solution, but it should never be put in one of the hot sanitizer machines that we use in some cafes. All right, so that was a lot of stuff to cover. We talked about all the different parts of the espresso machine that we use, our towels, our grinder, um, pulling a shot, how to dial in, cleaning the bar. If for any reason you want to re refresh on the information or make sure you understood something, feel free to rewind and rewatch. Um, at the end of this, there will be a quiz that you'll be taking before you go to class. So be sure to complete that quiz before attending class so that we know that you got it and we can move forward with learning even more and this time get into really tasty espresso.